Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. Cecily Neville, The Forgotten Plantagenet The history books are full of rich stories about men and women in past societies. We can learn about the kings and queens who ruled the kingdom, as well as the lords and ladies who attended their courts. If we think about medieval England, specifically the latter part, then we're taken to the Wars of the Roses and the battles that were fought. We think of King Henry VI and Richard III to name just a few, as well as the likes of Warwick Kingmaker and his daughter who became a queen. During the later medieval period, there were two notorious kings, brothers in fact, Edward IV and Richard III, and these kings were born to a rather high-ranking woman of the time, Cecily Neville. But my question is, why do we not know much about her today, and what was her life like in the 1400s? Cecily was rather well connected, and in a time where family connections were held in high regard, Cecily's bridges were superior. She was born on the 3rd of May 1415 to Ralph Neville, the first Earl of Westmoreland, and Joan Beaufort, the only daughter of John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, and his wife Catherine Swinford. Cecily's maternal great-grandfather was Edward III, and through her father she was also the aunt of the kingmaker Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick. At the age of just eight years old, Cecily was betrothed to by her father to his 13-year-old ward, Richard Plantagenet, the third Duke of York. In the October of 1429, when Cecily was 14, the two were married, and funnily enough, Richard Plantagenet was also descended from the same king as Cecily, Edward III, twice removed through both his mother and his father's side. Richard actually had a slightly better claim to the throne than the actual king, for he was descended through a more senior line. Cecily was also related to the king, Henry VI, through her Beaufort family, and interestingly, she is also linked to Queen Catherine Parr, being her great-great-great-aunt, with her being the sixth wife of her great-grandson, Henry VIII. Cecily was a Plantagenet, a Beaufort, a Neville, a Lancastrian and a Yorkist all rolled into one, so why haven't we heard more about her? You see, much like her son, King Richard III, Cecily was written out of the history books, intentionally, by the victors, i.e. the Tudors. And this happened even though she was the paternal grandmother of the mother of the Tudors, Elizabeth of York, wife and queen to Henry VII. Cecily also found herself being sidelined during her lifetime by her own daughter-in-law, Elizabeth Woodville, wife and queen to Edward IV. Being erased in real time meant that the history books were sure to follow suit. Even big selling books describing the Plantagenets only give Cecily a supporting role. She had such a heritage, so how could she not have played an important role? She was so familiarly linked to all the key players in the Wars of the Roses, yet she is so overlooked. But behind the scenes, she fought her own war, using intrigue, manipulation, and the power of words to support her family's struggle for power. Now, Cecily and Richard in total had 12 children, with only seven surviving past childhood, two of which becoming kings. Now, Cecily held one of the highest ranks as a woman, and although she still may have been constrained by the conventional ways a woman of the era should have behaved in terms of a life of piety, patronage, courtly attendance and support for her husband, Cecily doesn't strike as the type of woman to have behaved like a faithful dog at all times. Cecily had a great beauty about her and she liked to indulge in a luxurious lifestyle. She moved behind the expectations of a medieval noble woman for even though she supported her husband's actions in claiming the crown at the end of the 1450s, she also became directly involved in political events. Now after the death of her husband during the Battle of Wakefield in the December of 1460, Cecily's eldest son became king, going from Edward, the Earl of March, to King Edward IV in 1561. 
Cecily gained confirmation of her lands and rights, and even as a widow, she had enormous personal wealth, and it was with this that she continued her patronage of religious houses and the college founded by her husband at Fotheringhay in Northamptonshire. Cecily also adopted the role as Yorkist monarch, and after 1461, her main goal in life became the arrangement of a suitable marriage for her son, the king. When, in the May of 1464, he secretly married a low-born widow, Elizabeth Woodville, instead of a European princess, Cecily reacted angrily and refused to subordinate herself to the new queen, styling herself queen by right. By Edward marrying Elizabeth, not only had he alienated his mother, but also her powerful nephew, the kingmaker, Richard Neville. You see, he had been making negotiations with the French king for Edward's marriage. It's thought that by 1469, Cecily had declared Edward to be illegitimate, and was then trying to push for her second son, George, the Duke of Clarence, to have the crown. This, not surprisingly, forever damaged her relationship with Edward, and it's also believed that she, until his death, avoided the royal court and instead attended to her private interests. After her son died, she then revived her king-making activities. By this time, Cecily's sense of dynasty had been grown into perfection, and as her second son George had been executed by the king in 1478, Cecily focused on her next son, Richard, the Duke of Gloucester. She was now decisively acting to restore the true Yorkist line through him. So in 1483, the Duke of Gloucester became Richard III. And in support of Richard's claim to the throne, Cecily held a meeting at her London home to nullify Edward's will and supported the assertion that his sons, the princes in the tower, were illegitimate and so could not rule if the Yorkist dynasty was to remain pure. However, in the August of 1485, Richard, at the Battle of Bosworth Field, was defeated and killed by Henry Tudor and his army. Henry then firmly became king, and the then 70-year-old Duchess gave the impression of finally accepting defeat. Although saying that, there is evidence that after her death in 1495, many of her servants were involved in the conspiracy to dethrone Henry VII, hatched by Perkin Walbeck. Cecily's life and intrigues show that women could enjoy considerable influence in the masculine world of medieval politics, as well as in more conventional female roles. After Cecily's death, she was buried within Fotheringhay Church, and today you can still step inside and enjoy the beauty of this nearly 600-year-old landmark. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.